New England Wildflower Society has been working with more than 60 institutional partners to conserve the rich flora of the region. In 2015, the 115th anniversary of the Society, we undertook a big project to assess the state of the plants in New England, identifying conservation challenges and successes. We released the State of the Plants report, which received nationwide and even international attention. Here I outline some of the principal findings from the report, and you can also listen to a radio interview with Steve Kerwood and me on the NPR program, Living on Earth. If you're a member of any environmental organization, such as the Audubon Society, you've perhaps received similar reports and white papers that outline the state of the birds, the state of the insects, etc. So why is yet another report needed? But remember that plants are the basis of the habitats that support all other organisms. To me, nothing exemplifies that fact better than a sand dune, which is literally held together by plants. Yet, plants are mentioned only in passing in most environmental reports, and even then, somewhat implicitly. So, we thought it's a good idea to call attention to these quiet things that run the world. It's easy to ignore plants. Human beings have evolved to notice motion, the things that can chase us or eat us, or the things we want to chase in order to eat, and plants simply fade into a quiet green background. Botanists term our disregard for plants as plant blindness. These kids are focused on the bird they want to see, not the bird it's sitting on. But plant blindness is curable. The report documents trends in the New England flora, and it analyzes major stressors to plants and articulates what we don't know and need more research on, it develops a framework for conservation, and most importantly, lists steps that can be taken by individuals or at the community level and at the national level to conserve plants. And we have lots of data that enable us to put together this synthesis. Our New England Plant Conservation Program brings together partners across many different institutions, academe, state natural heritage programs, and a host of other conservation organizations such as the Nature Conservancy. Our plant conservation volunteers, and more on how you can join this core later, generate enormous amounts of valuable field data on the status of rare plant populations in all the counties of New England. And New England has a very rich history of botanical collecting and published scholarship, too. And the plant collections that end up in herbaria are very enlightening for understanding historical trends in flowering and population dynamics. Our Flora Novi Angliae, published by botanist Arthur Haynes in 2011, was the first comprehensive update in 50 years for all New England plants, updating plant nomenclature and presenting detailed keys to all the species. The Flora Novi Angliae also provided the foundation for Go Botany, which you're using throughout the course. And new observations posted to PlantShare alert us to plants that are newly appearing on the landscape, and it fills in our gaps uh, in our understanding of plant distributions. The Flora Conservanda is a summary of the rarity status of all plants listed as endangered, threatened, special concern, or historical in one or more New England state. We first published this in 1996 and published an update in 2012, which allows us to see how rare plants have changed in status during a 15-year period. And finally, we relied on the expertise of literally hundreds of botanists and ecologists. So what do all these data tell us? Well, there are more than 3,500 species, subspecies, and variety of native or naturalized plants in New England. About 31% of these documented plants are not native. And of those, 10%, or about 110 species, are regarded as invasive and directly threaten native species. We also note that there are hot spots of rare plant diversity in New England. This map, which shows New England town boundaries, was compiled from a study we conducted of 71 rare plant species. Darker towns have higher numbers of documented populations of rare plants, which typically correlates with higher numbers of plant species overall. We see clusters of species-rich towns along the marble bedrock belt of western Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Vermont, and also along the calcium-rich St. John's River in northern Maine. 
alpine areas of the White Mountains in New Hampshire also host a variety of boreal and subarctic species that can only survive in these small pockets of cold, harsh environments. The Connecticut River Corridor is also home to assemblages of rare plants, and the southern coastal plain of Rhode Island, Connecticut, Cape Cod, and the islands is characterized by sand plains and heathlands that support many rare plant species. This uh, may now be becoming familiar to you, having studied New England geology and the dynamics of our plant communities. New England has only 10 species of plants that are endemic, that is, ever recorded only from these six states. Three of those taxa are now extinct, having been obliterated from their narrow ranges. You'll be heartbroken to know that one is a crabgrass, Digitaria filiformis, subspecies Leviglum, and another is a hawthorn, Crotigus canedii, and the third a milk vetch, Astragalus robinsii, var robinsii. Three species may not be a lot, but they are gone forever. And the latest Flora Conservanda notes that 96 species are now considered historical in New England. They may exist elsewhere, but they're no longer part of our flora. However, one of our endemic species, Robin Sinkfoil, Potentilla robinsiana, is to date the only species removed from the Federal Endangered Species List, largely due to cooperative efforts to restore and protect its populations by New England Wildflower Society and our partners. And although our data are focused on rare plants of New England, it's important to realize that, on average, these species are listed as rare in nearly half of their North American range. This map from the Nature Serve sort of Explorer website shows states in yellow, orange, or red in which purple milkweed, Asclepius purpurescens, is regarded as imperiled plus two states in blue, including New Hampshire, in which the species is now considered extirpated. If we can figure out how to conserve these species in New England, we can devise a strategy for conserving the species throughout its range. So what are some of the most imperiled plant groups in New England and, and elsewhere? Well, more than a third of our arguably most charismatic species, the orchids, are listed in one or more states and the majority of moonworts in the family Ophioglossaceae are listed. These are diminutive members of the clade of ferns that you mostly have to get down on your hands and knees to see, but they are fascinating. I explore them on Go Botany. Members of the saxifrage family, uh, many of them confined to cold climates, are also listed. And hemiparasitic plants in the broomrape family, Orobanchaceae, are also disproportionately rare. Many species across the orchid, moonwort, and broomrape families depend either on an association with a host plant or a fungus from which they obtain essential nutrients. So in order to conserve these species, we need to understand and foster their relationships or symbioses with other organisms. The same goes for plants and pollinators. When we compared the rare plant species included in the 1996 Flora Conservanda and those in the 2012 Flora Conservanda, we could detect two groups of species, those that were obviously declining in population numbers during those 15 years, and those that appeared stable or were actually increasing in numbers during that time. Among the species shown on this graph in green that were declining, a disproportionate percentage are insect pollinated, whereas a larger proportion of stable or increasing species do not need to rely on insects. They're wind or self-pollinated. And this finding reflects that the decline in pollinators that we discussed earlier may be imperiling rare plants, and conversely that declining rare plants may provide fewer resources for already stressed out pollinators. Now let's consider five major habitat types in New England, indeed throughout northeastern North America, and ponder the many services that they provide to us and to other organisms, and the threats that are unique to some and common across them, and what we need to do in order to conserve them. Together, these habitats encompass more than 200 rare plant species, as well as many of the common species that are familiar everywhere. We'll take you from the mountains to the sea.
starting at the mountains, we encounter 48 rare species, of which four are considered globally rare, including that endemic species I mentioned earlier, robin sinkfoil, and another small rose, Giampechii, or white mountain avens, which is known only from the white mountains and two sites in Nova Scotia. Alpine habitats are threatened in the short term by the many hiking trails that thread through them, which can easily be diverted, schemes to build ski resorts and wind farms and other enterprises on summits also impact these areas. The building of the Cog Railway on Mount Washington has damaged some subalpine plant communities, which are slow to recover because of shallow soils and short growing seasons and challenging weather extremes. Climate change in the form of warming summer temperatures and reduced snowpack also alters the rate at which alpine plants emerge and flower, and sometimes mismatched with their primary pollinators. A recent study by the Manomet Center for Conservation Science estimated that if greenhouse gas emissions continue to increase, resulting in a 5 degree Fahrenheit increase in mean annual temperatures, Alpine communities will shrink significantly in size and become much more isolated from each other, meaning that pollinators will have to fly much greater distances to fertilize plants from different populations. And we all now know what that means for reduced genetic diversity within populations. So what can we do to stem this tide? Well, we can stem the tide of greenhouse gas emissions. We can also monitor changes in plant communities more closely and bank seed from these alpine plants, move trails, and restrict development to areas that are less vulnerable to disturbance. Many of these steps are already being taken. Our mixed northern hardwoods forest is the iconic landscape of New England, bursting into brilliant color in the fall. Now, richer variants of this forest, occurring on more calcium-rich soils, harbor 48 rare species of plants, five of which are considered globally rare. Illustrated here is golden seal, Hydrastis canadensis, which is a medicinally important plant that may be over-harvested in our region and elsewhere. These forests support some of our most beautiful birds, those that migrate to the New World tropics and that require large stretches of unbroken forest habitat in which to breed. Big mammals also roam these woods, taking care not to step on the salamanders that are migrating among the vernal pools nestled within the forest. A huge swath about 70% of our forests was cleared, as we saw earlier, during the 18th and 19th centuries. But today, forests are recovering. Are they the same forests, though, that existed before? No. Many are impoverished in the herbaceous understory species that were once somewhat common, such as orchids. Another animal that's contributing to the rarity of orchids and is decimating understory herbs and tree seedlings is our white-tailed deer. Because humans wiped out the deer's major predator, wolf, and few human hunters are being recruited in the next generation, deer populations have exploded in New England and elsewhere. The photo on the left shows a deer exclosure at the Harvard Forest in Petersham, Massachusetts, and is worth a thousand words. Inside the exclosure, seedlings and saplings abound. Outside the exclosure, where deer can freely graze, the forest floor is nearly devoid of new growth. Climate change, too, will change the nature of our forests. There'll be winners and losers. These maps show the current and projected distributions in 2100 of different types of forests under a scenario of reduced greenhouse gas emissions, shown in the middle, and continued increasing emissions, shown on the right. Under the higher emission scenario, sugar maple may be restricted by 2100 to northern Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine, with implications for our economically important maple syrup industry. Conversely, warmer adapted oak and hickory forests may become more widespread. So how can we save our forests? Well, there's good news here, too. Several large-scale initiatives, such as the Wildlands and Woodlands Initiative of the Harvard Forest, are helping to coordinate landowners across the region to conserve and sustainably use their tracts of forest land so that they can support all the creatures that depend on forests. 
We can also stem the infesting tide of invasive insects, such as the emerald ash borer and Asian longhorn beetle, by reducing the transport of wood products, such as firewood logs, between regions. Invasive plants coming into our forests, such as kudzu, Bulleri lobata, can be detected early and reported so that they can be controlled before they get out of control. And by studying the long-term population dynamics of over-harvested medicinal species such as golden seal, we're learning how to grow them more wisely in their native habitats. River habitats include the rivers themselves and the floodplains that they nourish. These places are home to 44 rare plant species, nearly a quarter of which are considered globally rare, including another variety of milk vetch, Jessup's milk vetch, a small legume that clings onto schist bedrock across the, along the banks of the Connecticut River. It's known from only three populations in the world. Now, a vast majority of vertebrates, including birds and amphibians and mammals, spend part of their life in river floodplains. Many insects, including predatory tiger beetles and dragonflies and damselflies and butterflies, spend time here too. And of course, birds use rivers as migratory flyways, navigating their lengths to find their way north in the spring and south in the winter. Rivers have been most impacted over our long history by dams. There are more than 10,500 dams placed in New England rivers alone. And floodplains also provide exceptionally rich soils with a yearly deposit of fine and nutrient-laden silts brought with every flood. So they've been eagerly converted to farmland. Where floodplains aren't serving as farmland, they're often regarded as dumping grounds, where no one will discover that old tire or couch you wanted to get rid of. Every year, the Connecticut River Watershed Council volunteers have many tons of garbage from Connecticut River shores. And moist, fertile floodplains host many invasive species of plants, particularly vines like oriental bittersweet, Celastris orbiculatus. One solution to these problems is to remove or rehabilitate defunct dams. New England leads the nation in removing dams that could pose a danger in flooding to life and property. We've gotten rid of 250 of them, of 10,500. We've got a ways to go. We need to comprehensively assess the dams that pose the most problems, as well as the pipes that pump many tons of raw sewage into our waterways during big storms. The good news is that most New England states have a strong plan in place to identify problem sources of pollution and to replace pipes and improve sewage treatment plants that currently spew pollution. And New England Wildflower Society and other conservation organizations are actively trying to restore populations of rare floodplain plants, such as Jessup's milk vetch, to their native habitats. We've heard a fair amount about rare sand plains in this course already, but I'll point out that more than 50 rare plants call these home, including 12 that are globally rare, such as sand plain gerardia, a hemiparasitic plant, where did you hear that term before, that occurs only in sand plains. Oh, and some cemeteries, interestingly enough, that were built on sand plains. They do drain well. Hundreds of insects pollinate, feed on, and generally depend upon the plants of these open habitats. I know, you're thrilled and probably itching all over as you ponder this, but some are really beautiful, such as this federally endangered corner blue butterfly. In addition, songbirds, our endemic cottontail rabbit, and several reptiles and amphibians also occur only in sand plains. But sand plants have been converted to a number of uses because, well, they perk. Their well-drained soils are usually flat or gently rolling and make them well-suited to development into airports and military bases and suburbs. Being disturbance-dependent systems, sand plants rely on fire to keep them open. But we humans hate fire occurring anywhere near our dwellings, and who can blame us? But we can use a variety of methods to keep these open areas open and to identify new abandoned areas that could make for exemplary sand plains if we only manage and restore them well. 
and we can educate people, not only nearby landowners, but everybody, about the biological importance of these places. Conservation organizations have been working very constructively with military branches to manage biologically important samplings, such as Fort Devens and Camp Edwards in Massachusetts. They've supported bio blitzes to identify huge numbers of rare plants, unusual insects, and other organisms that thrive in these sites. Now, finally, we arrive at the sea. We consider salt and brackish water marshes here. Although these habitats tend to support fewer plant species overall, because few plants can withstand the tidal and saline influences of these places, we note that they harbor 21 rare plant species, of which the highest proportion of all the habitats, six species, are globally rare. These coastal marshes support the early stages of three quarters of our commercially important sea fish and shellfish, such as crabs and bluefish and shrimp and oysters, and plenty of predatory birds, such as the glossy ibis pictured here, and osprey and others, that feed on these species. Believe it or not, many mammals also find their homes in these marshes, including voles or raccoons. Estuarine marshes are perhaps the most significantly affected by marsh dieback. 60% of the marshes on Cape Cod and Rhode Island are dying back. Why? Because of the explosion of crab populations. Crabs love to dig tunnels in the sediments, which uproots plants, and they also feed on the primary grasses of estuarine marshes. By killing these plants, the crabs, whether native or invasive, undermine the very foundation of the marshes, the plants that hold these sediments together. Why are crabs expanding in numbers? Well, because we've fished out their main predators, commercially important fish, which feed on juvenile crabs. Also, the common reed, Phragmites australis, has invaded marshes as we've changed the hydrology, or the tidal flushing, as well as the flood of nutrients that are coming into these places. And many marshes may become inundated by rising sea levels. We'll see evidence of this in a future lesson. We've learned earlier, though, how restoration of tidal flushing can help restore these ecosystems educating recreational fishers to reduce their catch of useful predatory fish can help stem the tide of marsh dieback. There are many examples of marsh restoration that appear to be succeeding, but the ultimate solution is to reduce the factors that are contributing to sea level rise, namely greenhouse gas emissions. So what are conservation professionals supposed to do? Is it all hopeless? Well, I couldn't get up in the morning if I thought it was hopeless. Our ultimate goal is to foster functioning ecosystems with species that are continuing to evolve in the wild in response to evolutionary pressures with as little intervention and input on our part as possible. We can't nurse them all 24-7, so we all need to create the environments in which a diversity of native plant species can thrive. Your own garden is part of a larger ecosystem. Remember that as you create it and nurture it. So here are the cogent steps that you can take as an individual to help the plants of our region, or frankly, any, any region, to survive. First, plant native plants. One native plant planted across 10 households will foster a major restoration program for birds or whatever other organism stirs your heart. Reduce herbicide and pesticide use. They poison your kids, your pets, yourself. Enough said. And educate yourself and your kids to appreciate plants. Help cure plant blindness. And remove invasive species and prevent the incursion of new ones. You know how to use Go Botany to identify invasive plants. Support land trusts. It's wonderful that many towns in New England have land trusts, groups of people who are working tirelessly to conserve important habitats for plants and other creatures and, and you to enjoy. Give your time to them. And if you don't have time, give your funds.
at the community level, you can help educate your municipal officials about the importance of planting native plants in public plantings, as opposed to the potentially invasive ones that may grow well but spread beyond their borders and don't support other biodiversity. If you're a parent, you can advocate for more education about botany in your school system. Perhaps your school participates in Envirothon, the national competition that challenges high school students to learn more about their surroundings and the challenges facing the environment. There's some emphasis on plants in this curricul curriculum, but the students I have interacted with are receiving too little exposure to plants. Get out there and inspire the next generation and support your local organic farm or your local forester uh, to practice sustainable techniques that will discourage the proliferation of invasives and encourage the succession of a diverse array of native plants. Finally, at the national level, we all need to be a lot louder about several issues, particularly the need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. If we can build more funding for plant research, so much the better. And we must strengthen laws across the country to prevent the taking of rare plant species and the destruction of wetlands. New England leads the nation in terms of laws with teeth that protect rare species and wetlands, but much more remains to be done. It's not all bad news by any means. There's much you can do. And plants are resilient if we give them the chance, as we've seen and will later see.